the winning, winning, winning blueprint, blueprint presents. presents. <laughs> Welcome to the special edition of In the Lab Room Weekend Rewind. I'm your host, Lou, and this weekend there was a firestorm of transactions that took place in the NFL. Thus, I created uh, this uh, segment, this show, to bring to you everything that happened so you don't miss anything. There's a lot of things that happened and something could have slipped uh, under your radar, and so I'm here to bring everything that happened to your attention. And we start with Terrell Owens being released from the Seattle Seahawks. I believe that this is the end of his illustrious career. Now, again, you know, he's a Hall of Famer. No mistake about it. Terrell Owens is a Hall of Famer. Will he be a first ballot Hall of Famer? Probably not. You can't piss people off and, and be a diva and, and someone that annoys a lot of people, not just in the media, not just teammates, but just people around the league in general and think that you're going to get in on, on your first ballot. And so he'll it'll probably take him longer than it really should. But Terrell Owens is a Hall of Famer. But back to his release for a second. If you've been following the NFL, then this release doesn't come to you as a surprise. Toward the tail end of his career, although still ultra productive, Terrell Owens began to be inconsistent, and very much so. A lot of drops, a lot of untimely drops as well. A lot of third down uh, completions that should have been made weren't because he would drop the ball. Lapses in concentration, and he's not the fastest guy anymore. He can still beat DBs on a consistent basis, but you got to catch the football. And he did not do that consistently uh, for the Seattle Seahawks in the preseason and Braylon Edwards outplayed him in the preseason. Make no mistake about it. Braylon Edwards was the better receiver. He's younger. He's got more left in the tank. And he can contribute for the Seattle Seahawks right now. Thus, T.O. Uh, was given his walking papers. And look, I don't see another team giving him a shot. This was it. It was a good run. He was a good player in this league, a big contributor for many years. And uh, I tip my cap to you, T.O. You, you weren't always the best soldier in the locker room or in the media. But on the football fields, there, there weren't many other receivers better to, to play this game than you. And so, again, I tip my cap to you, my invisible cap to you. And, uh, and I, I bowed you a, a farewell. And hopefully you're at peace with your career ending the way it did. Uh, at least you got a shot. A lot of people don't get that chance. You got that chance. You just didn't make the best of it when you got the chance. But you got a chance. And you didn't make it. But look, uh, I wish you all the best. And look, you had a, a hell of a career, man. Be proud of what you've done and the body of work that you've left behind uh, in the NFL. And so, hey, here's to you, man. Good career. All right. Also, something else that happened over the weekend. Tavares Jackson, uh, the Seattle Seahawks' former quarterback who really didn't get any reps in camp, was not seen in the preseason. This man, uh, for all intents and purposes, was put on the back burner. They told Tavares Jackson, look, you're not playing. You're not even in this quarterback competition. We're trying to shop you around as we speak. And so, finally... After the dust was settled, the Seattle Seahawks found a suitor for, for Tavares Jackson's services. And that suitor was the Buffalo Bills. And you know why they were interested and finally pulled the trigger? Because they realized 
what several teams around the league realize that Vince Young is not a good option at quarterback. Not starter, not backup, not anywhere. And it's sad because someone with such immense ability, athleticism, and his arm is pretty strong even though he has that slingshot type motion. Vince Young had all the tools to be a good quarterback in this league, but I don't think his work ethic ever matched the, the amount of athleticism that he possessed. And so I don't think he was ever willing to put in the work and put in the time that it was going to take to become a, a good contributing quarterback in this league, a solid quarterback that could play eight to ten years in this league. I don't think he was willing to put in the work. I think that throughout the course of his uh, career, whether it be collegiate, professional, even high school, I don't think he ever put in the work. I think in high school and college, he was just athletically superior to, to those around him, to his peers. And so he was able to not put in the work. He was able to just show up and be better than everyone else on the field. And that got him to the NFL. And I think that that first year, his first year in the in the league in Tennessee, when they went eight and eight, I think that was fool's gold. Um, the Titans going eight and eight in his first season, and him really exploding onto the scene, winning ball games with his legs. I think the the peak of that season, and maybe even the peak of his career, was that run in Houston when he won the game in overtime. And I thought the sky was the limit for him at that point. But he never put the time in that it takes to be an NFL quarterback, a starting caliber quarterback in this league. And his true potential never came to fruition because he wasn't willing to put in the work that it took to be a good quarterback in the National Football League. And so uh, his time has finally come to an end. And, and look, after a while, teams get tired of trying to be the one uh, to rectify the problem. Everyone thinks that they have the, the Midas touch and that maybe he just needs a change of scenery. Maybe the light bulb will come on when he comes to this uh, team. But he's ran out of options at this point. I think this is it. I feel like a lot of times, if you can't make it in Buffalo, if you can't make it in Oakland, those are the two last locations uh, on your way out of the league. That's the last stop in your NFL journey. If you can't make it in Buffalo, if you can't make it in Oakland, then your career is essentially over. And uh, th this was it for Vince Young. And so that trade that Chan Gailey made for Tavares Jackson, it signaled the end for Vince Young. And he knew he was on borrowed time once that trade was consummated. And so he started tweeting and letting everybody know this is it. And uh, it'll be interesting to see if he even tries. Because sometimes I don't even think Vince Young um, wants to try. And so I don't even know if he wants to try and play anymore. His, his will might have been taken from him after this last chance in Buffalo. And so we'll see. We'll see what he does next. I don't think that he'll get another chance. I think this is it for him, and rightfully so. I mean, there's, there's only so many opportunities someone like a Vince Young needs uh, to show what he can do. I mean, we've seen what Vince Young can do. We know he can make things happen with his legs. But he's not a running back. He's not a receiver. He's a quarterback, and he needs to make things happen with his arm. And I don't think... That at this stage in his career, he's where he needs to be. And no one has time to coach him up. He's too old to be uh, trying to be coached up about things that he should have learned already at this point in his NFL career. So uh, I think that's going to be a career for Vince Young as well. And again, that's very unfortunate because the amount of talent that Vince Young has, it shouldn't be... Uh, someone that is exiting the league this early in their career. But again, when you don't want it as bad as the next man, when you don't want it as bad as somebody that doesn't have as much talent as you, who's willing to put in the work, when you don't want to do the things necessary, go the extra mile to become great, 
when average is good enough for you because it's always been good enough for you, this is what happens. And so this is a really, this is a true tale of talent being wasted because of lack of self motivation, lack of self drive, lack of wanting to be good from within. I don't think it was ever innate uh, to Vince Young to want to be great. I think he was just good with the skills and that he possessed, but he never really wanted to take the time to take that next step to be the quarterback that he needed to be. And so this is a true uh, story of how talent can be wasted, can be squandered. And so Vince Young is now um, a free agent. And we'll see what his next move is. But again, I don't see Vince Young getting another shot. And honestly, truth be told, I don't think he needs another shot. Like we've seen enough of Vince Young. We know what he is at this point. I've watched a lot of him in his preseason. He hasn't learned anything. He hasn't taken any steps towards being a better quarterback. I think at this point in his career, he is what he is. And so it's a shame that Vince Young will be defined in his career by statements like, let Kerry have it's unfortunate, but we move forward. And the Seahawks made an interesting move over the weekend. And we spoke to this on the Friday episode. We spoke about it on the Thursday episode. And it came to fruition on Sunday evening. The Seattle Seahawks named Russell Wilson their starting quarterback. Russell Wilson starting at quarterback makes it five rookie quarterbacks starting week one of the 2012 NFL season. Of course, you have Andrew Luck starting for the Indianapolis Colts. You have Robert Griffin III starting for the Washington Redskins. You have Ryan Tannehill starting for the Miami Dolphins. You have Brandon Whedon starting for the Cleveland Browns. And you have now Russell Wilson starting for the Seattle Seahawks. Who saw this coming when he was drafted with the third round selection of the Seattle Seahawks? Can't say many people projected him as the day one, week one starter. And so this is an amazing feat because everybody knew Russell Wilson had the intangibles to start in the National Football League. What they didn't know was that he was going to get an opportunity to show it so early on. And with his size, or lack thereof, it was always going to be a question of whether he could get it done in the National Football League. But Pete Carroll, again, being the coach that he is, saw past that, saw the talent, saw the intangibles, saw his ability to make plays inside and out of the pocket, and, and decided to give this young man a chance. And so this is going to be interesting to see what the Seattle Seahawks are going to do in the 2012 season. And it's kind of refreshing to see a franchise ignore uh, the money that they paid to a player to come in and be uh, or assume a position as they did with Matt Flynn and tell him that, hey, you can have a seat on the bench and be the backup. And if we need you, be ready to step in. He is a rookie, of course. Things do happen. Be ready but you're not starting. You're not a starting quarterback for the Seattle Seahawks right now at this moment. That job goes to Russell Wilson. And so uh, Pete Carroll says he doesn't mind having an expensive backup. And that's the right attitude to have. And I've always said this about Pete Carroll. Say what you want about Pete Carroll and his rah-rah attitude and his college mentality when coaching NFL players. But Pete Carroll is all about competition, putting the best man on the field to get the job done. You know, a lot of coaches say it, but a lot of them don't actually go through with it. Pete Carroll says it. 
He means it and he does it. And here's another example of Pete Carroll putting his money, no pun intended, where his mouth is. So once again, Russell Wilson will be your week one starter for the Seattle Seahawks in the 2012 season as they take on the Arizona Cardinals in week one. That's another rookie quarterback to look out for. And I'm, I'm telling you what, there's a lot of buzz going on around the league about all these rookie QBs starting uh, in their uh, inaugural seasons and starting right away. And so keep a watchful eye on these rookie quarterbacks to see who out of this class actually lasts, not just this season, but has a, a, a solid, if not great career. Let's see of these Five. We're going to call them the starting five. That's, that's what we're going to dub them. From now on, we're going to call these starters in 2012 the starting five. Let's see who makes it. Who's the best? Who, who has longevity out of the starting five? Me being a Redskins fan, my money's on Robert Griffin III. But I like, I like a lot. I like it a lot. What I see out of Andrew Luck, he looks the part of a can't-miss quarterback. I like his moxie. There's been times where he's gotten beat up or he's made a mistake or when his players didn't step up for him thus far in his young career in the preseason, and he's come back and responded and made some really good throws, some good reads. He's poised in the pocket. He stands tall. He makes good decisions. I like Andrew Luck. You know, Robert Griffin III, again, I'm biased. However, I can be very objective. And I've seen uh, his game, and I like what I've seen. The thing that worried me the most about him was the fact that he was an elusive guy, but I, I didn't see the elusiveness in the pocket. The thing I love about Cam Newton is he makes people miss within the pocket, still looking to throw the football down the field. But he can make you miss in and just a variety of ways, and, and was so elusive in the pocket, and that's what you need. And I didn't know if Robert Griffin III was elusive in the pocket. I knew he could get away and use his speed to get away once he got out of the pocket, but what happens when you go bootleg, play action fake, and you, you roll, as soon as you turn around, there's a free rusher coming in your face. Can you make that guy miss? And he's shown me, yeah, the prowess to be able to do that in this preseason. And, and that was probably the biggest worry and, co and concern I had for him. And he's alleviated that for me. So I feel confident. Now we just got to hit the deep ball. And so I, I look for Robert Griffin III to have a, a huge impact on the Washington Redskins to have a huge season. You look at Ryan Tannehill, and this was the guy that I coveted out of Texas A&M, I, I thought that the Redskins, if we weren't going to pony up the picks and we were just going to stay at six, I was willing to, to concede the fact that we needed a quarterback and Ryan Tannehill would be there. Maybe six was going to be too early for him, but I was willing to make that uh, pick and, and, and say that, look, we need a quarterback. We can't go into the next season with Rex Grossman as our quarterback. You have to do something. Ryan Tannehill, was, I watched a lot of Texas A&M football scouting this guy, and I like what I saw. Big, tall, strong guy, uh, run, can run. He used to be a former receiver, so he's very athletic. You can see it. He can move around. He's very smart, can make all the throws, and, and he gets it. And I think what accelerated his process and – his rise to a starting QB for the Miami Dolphins was the fact that their offensive coordinator, Mike Sherman, was his head coach at Texas A&M last year and has been his head coach for the last two seasons. And so he already knows the playbook. Most rookies come in and they have a learning curve. That wasn't the case for Ryan Tannehill. He was teaching veterans on the Miami Dolphins what to do. He was giving them pointers. On, on things in the playbook, little nuances that he picked up while he was at Texas A&M. And so uh, that helped him along in the process. That helped him speed up any kind of learning curve that he might have uh, endured. It, it really was sped up by the fact that he knew the playbook. 
he was familiar with the offensive coordinator, Mike Sherman. And so, again, this Miami Dolphins team lacks talent at the wide receiver position. That's why I thought the Chad Johnson release was so big because Chad might not have been the same uh, receiver that was a constant you know, leader in receiving yards and in big plays when he was in Cincinnati in his, in his golden years, in his prime years. He might not have been that guy anymore. But I thought he was still he still had something left in the tank. He still had something to prove. Yeah, coming off that season he had with the New England Patriots last year, I thought Chad had a lot to prove and he was going to go out and have a, a nice season. And taking him away or him or Chad actually taking himself out of the picture and uh forcing the Dolphins to make a move it really limited and hindered this uh, offensive attack, I think, because they don't have a true number one receiver. I love Devon Best. I think he's a good guy. And they might even be playing him out wide, and I think he's a slot guy. He's deadly in the slot. But they don't have anybody on the outsides to compliment him. If I'm a team and I know the Dolphins are looking to throw the football, I'm keying in on Devon Best. Who else do you have to throw the football to? And so... The Dolphins need to make uh, some moves or do something to show up that wide receiving corps because if you watch Hard Knocks, you know they, they don't have a lot of talent at wide receiver. They don't have a lot of talent on the offensive side of the football, period. And so they got a long way to go. And so I feel for uh, Ryan Tannehill because there's plays to be made there with that young man, with Ryan Tannehill. But who is he going to be able to rely on and say, hey, it's third and five. I need to go to somebody. Who's that guy for him? It could be Devon Best. But if I'm, like I said, if I'm the opposing team playing against the Dolphins, third and five, I'm looking to stop Devon Best. Whatever I need to do to make sure he's not the one that gets me on third down, that's what I'm going to do because that's the one person I know can hurt me on third down. And so we'll see. We'll see if anyone steps to the forefront and and helps Ryan Tannehill out. But, again, this Dolphins team is not going to be very good in 2012. And so there's going to be a lot of growing pains, and there's going to be a lot of ups and downs. But look for Ryan Tannehill to, to be a solid contributor for the Dolphins in 2012 because he gets it. He gets it as a quarterback, and, and he knows his playbook. I think he's comfortable already in the offense. He just needs some help uh, from the guys around him on the offensive side of the football. Looking at Brandon uh, Whedon, he's got weapons. You know, he's they, the, the Browns have did a good job of trying to start acquiring talent because they that's the key phrase for the Browns is talent and acquiring it in masses. They need talent on that football team. And so the Browns, they have Muhammad Masakwa. You just don't know about Muhammad Masakwa with all of these concussions. So let's assume that Muhammad Masakwa is not going to play a full 16 games. Let's say he's not going to play 10 games. Let's say he's going to play eight games. You have Muhammad Masakwa in the mix a little bit. You look at Josh Gordon. This guy, this is a big physical threat that... These guys are all young, so they need to grow together. Travis Benjamin, another receiver they drafted out of the University of Miami. And so he's got weapons. If Again, another uh, concussion issue is with Benjamin Watson, the tight end. And he's a threat in the receiving game if he can stay healthy and stay away from the concussions that have uh, limited him throughout the course of his career. There's some weapons there. Trent Richardson needs to get healthy. I like Montario Hottesty as well. Another guy that just needs to stay healthy. Trent Richardson just had his knee scope not too long ago. They're looking for him to be ready week one. He has to stay healthy. A lot of guys around there are, are injured right now, but if they can stay healthy, get the ball out of Whedon's hands quick. I liked what they did with him in that Green Bay preseason game. You know, three-step drop, ball out of his hand when that third step hits the ground, ball out, you know, stops, slants, outs, comebacks. Keep 
the ball moving. Stay ahead of the down and distance. Let's try to find yourself in third and manageable. I thought they did a good job of that in that Green Bay game. That's something that they need to continue to build off of um, in order for Whedon to be successful. Again, this Browns team is not going to be a very good football team in 2012. And so the best thing that Brandon Whedon can do is start to grow with these receivers. Start to, to build a rapport with these guys because, again, a lot of them are young and they're going to grow together. He came in. He's a rookie. Travis Benjamin is a rookie. You look at Josh Gordon, he's a rookie. You still got Muhammad Massaqua, hasn't been in the league that long. And don't forget second-year uh, man Greg Little, uh, the receiver out of North Carolina that they drafted last year. He's been he's been playing good football as well. He just needs to become a, a, a more consistent receiver. But again, another young receiver to grow with, Brandon Whedon, and so... He has targets to throw the football to. The, the senior uh, member of that wide receiving corps is, is Josh Krebs. And so, look, if you're weeding, build a rapport with these guys and start spreading the football around. Get the ball in your playmakers' hands and let them help you out. Let them do the rest. I look for Brandon Whedon to have a solid campaign in the 2012 season of all the quarterbacks that I named thus far as rookies in the starting five, he worries me the most just because I'm not sure how everything's going to work in Cleveland in terms of he needs a running game to, to augment the passing game, to take pressure off of him. Is Trent Richardson going to be healthy? Is he going to be able to to be a cowbell. Is Montario Hardesty going to be someone they can rely on, you know, to spell Trent Richardson? If these guys go down with injuries, who do you have at running back? How do you take pressure off of Brandon Whedon? I've said, I spoke to the fact that he's playing with rookies and they need to grow together. That's also a weakness, though, because they're rookies. And maybe one of the hardest positions to come in and have an immediate impact in the league at his, his receiver. That's why what A.J. Green did last year was so impressive because you don't see rookies come in and, and, and take the NFL by storm too often. You know, one of the greatest performances in a single season I've ever seen by a receiver was Randy Moss's rookie season. And those don't happen often. You don't get guys that come along and just put up gaudy numbers in their rookie season as receivers. If you get 500 yards receiving out of a rookie receiver, that is something that you will take gladly. That is a welcome number and production from a rookie receiver. So to think that these guys are going to be able to contribute, you know, big numbers for Brandon Whedon is asking a lot. And so um, I just don't know if the parts that he has around him are going to be enough to help him be successful. We'll see. Again, of the starting five, he worries me probably a little bit more so than Ryan Tannehill. And then the last of the starting five, which is a surprise, was Russell Wilson. Starting for the Seattle Seahawks, week one. And I probably should be more worried about him, but I'm really not. Because I think he, as a, as a quarterback, he understands what he has to do. He knows his limitations. He knows he's 5'10". He knows he's 5'9". Okay, he, he knows his height. He, he, no one is surprising him by telling him, hey, you're short. He knows that. So he knows what he has to do to be successful, which is exactly why he started. And he's not afraid to pull the ball down and use his athleticism to get him out of trouble. And he knows when to do it. And he's been putting the ball on the money. He's been making sound plays, making good throws. He looks the part of an NFL quarterback. And mentally, he understands the game. He understands what it takes to get the job done on the football field. And so I don't really worry about him as much. The thing I worry about with him is, again, can he get it done 
on that team in that division. The 49ers are the bullies on the block in the NFC West. Can he overcome that hurdle that is the San Francisco 49ers? Can he make sure that they don't have letdowns against the teams in a division like the, Ram, um, the Rams and, and the Cardinals? Can he take that act on the road and, and quiet down uh, opposing crowds and, and stadiums? Can he put a hush over them? Is he willing and, and ready and able to step up and be a starting quarterback in this league and be successful at running a pro-style offense in Seattle. Let's see what he's about. He, they, they have some weapons. You look at Braylon Edwards. You look at Golden Tate. You look at Doug Baldwin. They have guys to get the football to. You look at this roster, and the Seahawks also have Sidney Rice at wide right receiver. And it's easy to forget about Sidney Rice. I myself am a victim of forgetting about him on this roster because he's always injured. And he's finally healthy. Let's see how long he stays healthy. But Sidney Rice is also a viable option. They, they brought him in. They paid him a lot of money to be a number one on this team. Let's see if he can come back and contribute and, and help Russell Wilson and make the transition from college QB to NFL starter in his rookie season. He has people to get the football to. Beast Mode will miss a um, couple of games to start out the season with the suspension. He'll be back. And so Russell Wilson has the parts around him right now to get this team in a position that in week 16 and 17 they could be playing for a possible playoff spot. But he has to play sound football. He can't make a, a lot of mistakes. He's a rookie. He's going to make mistakes. But he can't only make a lot of mistakes. And uh, the only thing I worry about with him is, again, I mean, you hate to harp on it, is his size. Is he going to get a lot of passes batted down at the line of scrimmage? Again, he knows his height is a, is a limitation to some extent. He, he knows... He's not a 6'5 quarterback that when standing tall, he's going to get the ball over, you know, linemen who coming with a rush and who don't get there and put their hands up. He's going to have to find lanes. That's something he's always had to do, though. So I don't see that being a big issue, but it's something that you have to, to consider when seeing Russell Wilson in the game. That's something you just have to take into consideration. But. I, I like it. I like the, the the move by Pete Carroll. I think he is the best option at quarterback right now. And, and throw him in there and see what he can do. I mean, Matt Flynn isn't going anywhere. And you paid him the money to, to be a quarterback in Seattle. He'll be there if, if Russell Wilson doesn't pan out the way you thought he was. Matt Flynn is right, in, right there in the wings. And so give the man a shot. See what he can do. I like the move. And that's your starting five. Let's see how they all go throughout the course of the 2012 season and moving forward. Let's see if all of these guys start and finish the season as their team's starting quarterbacks. You also look over the weekend. The Jets continue their monumental struggle in the preseason. And I'm, I'm one in the camp who believes that it's the preseason. And, and although they've looked disgusting this whole preseason, they've looked just horrendous. I'm one of the few who I'm not really putting a lot of stock into how bad they're looking. I'm not really overly perturbed uh, their lack of offense, their lack of scoring. They haven't scored a touchdown in the preseason to this point. We've had three full games. They haven't sniffed the end zone yet. But I'm not concerned because the preseason is full of vanilla offenses and defenses. And so when you don't score, it's not just you not being able to score. It's not. It's you not wanting 
to show uh, opposing teams, especially ones you have to play in the regular season, what you have in store for them. You don't want to give them too much on film to dissect early on in the regular season. And so I get it. And they have a new offensive coordinator. And so, you know, Tony Sperano is their new offensive coordinator. And so they're going to have some, some wrinkles to iron out. And it's natural for you to struggle, you know, just getting into a new system and a new playbook. And also, they're not, they don't have all their parts. You know, San Antonio Holmes injured himself early in camp. Missed a couple of preseason games, just came back for the third one, and they weren't really in sync yet. And then you got to remember that their second receiver, that receiver starting opposite of San Antonio, is a rookie who's raw, who has a ways to go. And so the Jets, they do have a long way to go, but I'll tell you this that once the season starts, once the regular season begins, I have full confidence and faith in Tony Sperano and that Jets offense that they'll do enough to win ball games. You'll start to see things that you didn't see. Uh, wildcat, no wildcat. Are they going to do it? Aren't they going to do it? Of course they're going to do it. Of course they're going to utilize Tim Tebow. You'd be a fool if you think that they're not going to use Tim Tebow in a different combination of ways. You'd be a fool to think that they're just going to use Tim Tebow in short yardage or by the goal line. No, he's going to get on the field uh, in, in different sub packages that they just have for him. And they're going to do some gadgety plays. I'm telling you right now, this Jets offense is going to look a lot like Miami Dolphins offense of 2008 when they won the division, the AFC East, and went to the playoffs and hosted a, a home playoff game. They're going to do a lot of things unconventionally, and they're going to catch a lot of teams off guard, and they're going to score some points. They're not going to be uh, a team that's going to put up 30, 27 points a game or anything like that. They're still going to be the Jets who struggle to score you know, in bunches, but they're going to, they're going to score points. They're not going to be a team that goes two, three-game stretches without scoring touchdowns. Now, this offense will be enough that the defense can do what it needs to do and have the leeway to do what it needs to do to help this team win games. I think the Jets are a playoff team this year. And th this preseason has not uh, changed my mind or swayed me in, in any uh, form or fashion. I still feel like the Jets... When the regular season begins, we'll start to score points. And they will look a lot better than they did in this preseason. Mark my words. Stamp it. That's how I feel. You move on to other teams that had games in the preseason. And the New England Patriots took on the Tampa Bay Buccaneers over the weekend. And tell you what. The Patriots did not look sharp and just to give you uh, some in, some insight and some perspective as to how Bill Belichick felt about uh, the Patriots performance Tom Brady was in the game with under two minutes to go in the third quarter most teams around the league played their starters into the third quarter, maybe a possession or two, and then they yanked them. Brady played the whole third quarter, essentially. The first team offense, uh, Brady took some shots. He held on to the ball too long. Uh, they looked out of sync. Then they beat him up pretty good. Brady took some shots from that Tampa Bay Buccaneers defense. And they were all over him, harassing him, making him uncomfortable in the pocket. And so... They got work to do. A lot of teams look out of sorts right now. The Patriots look to be out of sorts. I feel like the Packers aren't clicking on all cylinders right now. You know, a lot of these high-octane offenses 
aren't in midseason form yet, and that's to be expected. But the Patriots, again, just like I spoke to the Jets, they will turn it on when the regular season gets here. They're a veteran group. They know what they have to do. They know what it takes to win. They'll get it done when the regular season gets here. But it was just alarming to see Brady taking shots and, and the offense looking as stagnant as it did and Bill Belichick uh, forcing them to play essentially three whole quarters in the third preseason game. And the, the team that they were playing, the Tampa Bay Bucks, had an announcement of their own, which I didn't even think was a surprise to anyone. They, they named Doug Martin their starting running back over the weekend. And again, no surprise here. I had already spoke in the Tampa Bay Buccaneers lab report and experiment that I thought he would be the starter. You don't move back into the first round and trade up and snag a guy if you don't believe he's a starter for you day one. I mean, it, they made the point to to go get Doug Martin. and This was his guy. This was Greg Schiano's guy. He wanted Doug Martin in there. And, of course, LeGarrette Blunt is still going to get a nice size of the workload. But make no mistake about it, the versatility that Doug Martin brings to the table, the ability to catch the football out of the backfield, of course, uh, being able to run the football. But uh, what a lot of rookies don't bring to the table, you know, in their first season, Doug Martin is already equipped with the ability to protect on third downs as a third down back. And so he's at every down back for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. They like everything that he can do and what he brings to the table. And so uh, them reporting that Doug Martin is going to start didn't surprise me, and I don't think it surprised a lot of you out there. You saw this coming. And so uh, look for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers to employ a two-headed monster at the running back position, but it's going to be spearheaded by Doug Martin. And uh, really, th that's in a nutshell, what went on over the weekend. A lot that I just covered. And it was so much I thought we needed to do a weekend rewind. And so uh, now you've been informed as to all the happenings of the weekend. And now we can move forward to these roster moves. And it's going to be a lot of roster moves taking place, as you can already see. Uh, also, a quick note, uh, this one went kind of under the radar, and rightfully so. Uh, he's been an afterthought for the last two, three seasons now, and I think this is a career for him as well. But uh, Sean Merriman was released um, last week, and I think that's a career for him as well. He just was never the same after the ACL injury, and, and he's just had a lot of knee trouble and He's never been that explosive guy that you know, was blowing up tackles and, and getting by them and getting to the quarterback. And he was never, you know, lights out after that ACL injury. And he, he battled and he gave it all he had to try to get back, but it just wasn't in the cards. And so, again, if you can't make it in Buffalo, you're probably going to be out of the league here shortly. Again, Oakland and Buffalo, for me, are your two last stops before you make it out of the league. If you hit one of those and you don't make it, chances are you won't get another chance around the league. And so I think that's going to be it for Sean Merriman as well. He had a good run. It was short, but it was explosive you know, while it lasted. And so um, happy trails to Sean Merriman. All right, and so that's going to do it for this Weekend Rewind, and glad you could join me for it, and I thank you for uh, tuning in. A lot of information to cover as the weekend was a very busy time in the NFL as we inch closer to the start of the 2012 season. A lot of information was covered, and again, just keep your ears and eyes peeled as a lot of transactions will be taking place over the next few days as teams make the move to cut these rosters down to that final 53-man roster and the eight practice squad members as well. So you're looking at around 61 players. But the 53-man roster 
will have to be set by Friday. And so uh, Friday night is the cutoff for these rosters to be set. And so you'll you look at uh, a lot of these teams and who are they going to cut loose? What veterans are going to shake loose? What are going to be some surprise cuts that happen? You don't know, but you're going to have to stay tuned to find out. And that'll be it for this weekend rewind. Thank you for joining me. And uh, enjoy the rest of the preseason, offseason, because the regular season is really vastly approaching and is upon us. Get ready for some NFL football. If you can't wait and you need something to wet your palate, college football will be on this week. That's when you know it's really time. When college football starts up and gets into the swing of things, you know it's football season. And with that, I'm out. Have a good one. Thanks for joining me. Weekend Rewind.
lab, lab, quiz. lab, lab, lab. lab. Lab, 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 lab.